This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know, the Spirit of God is at work to expand love to include all people, to welcome all in and to make room at the table. The grace of God is free and available in this congregation. So friends, be who you are and be welcome here. Welcome to the worship of Wayside Presbyterian Church of Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm James Bernhardt. Thanks be to God for the generosity evident in the many bags donated for the Erie City Mission Thanksgiving dinner, and thanks to Linda Pence, who coordinated this effort. The Rise Against Hunger meal preparation event will be Saturday morning, November 13th, in the Fellowship Hall at Wayside. There, will, there are still a few slots left for anyone 10 years up, uh, old and up to participate. Please sign up either in the church office or on the church website or through the sheet that's in the church lobby. Plan to stick around at Wayside after worship on November the 21st when we will be decorating the church for Advent and Christmas. There will be a pizza lunch served and there will be work to do to make our building bright for the holidays. This will be a fun return to celebration of the holidays after a year when we could not be together for Christmas. So I hope you'll feel free to come and be part of that. Well now, let us worship God. As we make ready to 
hear from God's word, let us first be in prayer. Holy God, your word is life and your promises trustworthy and true. By your spirit, write your word upon our hearts so that we may be your new creation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In our Sunday school class a week ago, our presenter, uh, Dr. Robert von Thaden, reminded us how Martin Luther strongly suggested that the book of Revelation be stricken from the Bible, along with the letter of James, as not being worthy of inclusion nor presenting anything helpful about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We might agree that enough odd suggestions about the meaning of passages from the book of Revelation have come out over time that, that maybe Luther had a point, but the reading we have today is probably, probably one of the very best from that book. Before launching into the reading, just a few footnotes. The hope present in this lovely text is for a redeemed and remade creation. And not that the sea is bad, it will say something about the sea, but within the book of Revelation, the sea, the water, is the source of chaos. You might recall that in Genesis, in that first story of creation, it begins with an unformed chaos and the spirit of God is moving over the face of the deep. And in the vision of the city of Jerusalem in this passage, certainly Jerusalem was a controversial city then and now, but the vision of the city of Jerusalem is meant to portray the ideal, the holy city as a place of many nations and people in this city representing the presence of God. And you will hear the word new used again and again in this passage, a contrasting word to what has been. So listen now for God's word from Revelation 21, 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them as their God. They will be God's people, and God himself will be with them. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today, we are celebrating in our worship the day that normally follows Halloween. That day is known as all Saints Day after All Hallows Eve. It's a day on which we have normally tended to focus on those who have died. We too will take a few moments in our own worship service on Sunday morning to do that. We're so grateful for people who have come before us, those we have known and those who we've loved, whose faith and whose faithfulness have had an influence in life, both for us individually or in our family, but also in the church, in the community, even beyond us, way out into the world. Their vision of what can be is important. Their hope, their confidence in the possibilities their faith in God gives them, well, it has a trajectory, doesn't it? And it has momentum. The challenge for us is to live in the light of hope in God. I have an example from my life that has to do with my dad, who died almost 14 years ago. But near the end of his life, he had 
he had an epiphany of sorts. He was in the church choir with a man who, unfortunately, he had not thought well of for years. You know, as sometimes happens to us, we have an impression or we have an attitude that really we have not explored very well. Well, this man suffered the loss of a loved one. And my dad, being at least a little diplomatic, he conveyed his sympathies to this man. And the man who, for whatever reason, opened up and started spending, uh, spent a few minutes uh, sort of telling my dad, responding to my dad's sympathy with, with something that my dad found actually quite revelatory and moving about this man. And when, when my dad talked to me about it a few days later, he wondered if maybe he had been mistaken about this man. <laughs> so he started working at relating to him. And as it turns out, they began a friendship. As my dad said, it was so strong, he said, I feel I've wasted precious time. I remember this, this man, this man spoke to me after my dad's funeral about how special their friendship had been. So to, to tell that story, it, it's, it's sort of a cross between what I believe is true about eternity and the present. It's good to envision our great grandparents or our grandparents or our parents dwelling in eternity who are now in that realm, aware of the limitations of their visions, as good and wonderful as those visions might have been. There's something eternal invading our present when we have an epiphany now that changes how we may relate to another or even a community of others. In both Paul's letter to the Romans in the pastoral letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament, we're given the image of runners in a race struggling against the weakness of our human tendencies and the weight of sin that clings too closely. But nevertheless, in their running the race of faith, they're being cheered on, on by the saints, wanting us to not become too enchanted by the visions of the present, or too comfortable with all that we accommodate ourselves to, that we might cease to lean toward the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. The kind of vision of a kingdom to be hoped for in Revelation, but that may and can have its correspondence in the here and now. So that vision from Revelation brings to mind some of the movies that have attempted to, to give a glimpse into a new heaven and a new earth. And, and by doing so, they, they cast back into the present of that movie something hopeful about a reality. One movie in particular is the movie Titanic, if you've seen that, where in its closing images, we see the reunion of the two stars, Jack and Rose. We see them in reunion in the hereafter. No longer old, they're young. They're reunited on the grand staircase of the now redeemed ship. And there together is a view into a cinematic idea of eternity where the servant class people whose births were way down in the lower parts of the ship are joined on that grand eternal scene with the fabulously wealthy of that era, all, all equal in eternity. I note that in that same view, vision, we don't see the place of the vanquished nemesis or any other unnamed wrongdoers in that particular Hollywood heaven. And so that's why the movie Places in the Heart, if you've ever seen that, brings home some of the lesson in this vision from Revelation. Because the really the final scene in that movie, it depicts a church of worshipers gathered around sitting in pews where communion plates are being passed. And in this redemptive scene, the victims of tragic deaths, they sit 
alive and at peace side by side, even though their lives have had truly tragic effect upon each other. And the sad incidents in which they were enmeshed are now lost to the good joining together side by side in the supper of Christ. And in these images, the one who was blind now sees. And the great racial divide of our heritage, it has no power there. And enemies are no longer enemies. And these are truly cinematic attempts, though, to pull back the veil, to reveal to us as a revelation of the reality of God's new heaven and new earth, even as we keep on in the old one. The word revelation, which tends to make people oh, uncomfortable, the word revelation is an apt English rendering of the word apocalypse, a Greek word which means to pull back the veil, to see what is reality that is unseen because of the overpowering images of our present. And that realm toward which all human life is heading is one in which all is redeemed, saved, we might say, by the grace of Jesus Christ. Those divisions of human creating, the disappointments that may overwhelm us, the unrealized hopes, as well as the pursuits, good and bad, that may occupy a lion's share of our energy and resources are not lost and do not dissipate like a mist, but all are redeemed. All are measured by a different kind of measurement, the measurement of God's grace, so that we will see, we will see with eyes that are different, and we will appreciate with sensibilities that are remade, so that the best of us will meet the best of everything else because of the overwhelming grace that is in Jesus Christ. We picture our loved ones, and uh, we picture uh, those who have been there, and we, we hope in this life for the power that redeems them and all of creation. We hope that that power will invade our lives now and will invade our world. Then may the power that so at work work in us and through us and beyond us. Then may we hear with joy the voice from the throne that holds the past, that holds the present, that holds the future, speaking to us the great good news. See, I am making all things new. In that hope, let us live. Amen.
Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in spirit. Take my yoke upon you and find rest for your souls. Friends, we come now to sharing in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And our Lord Jesus invites all who trust in him to come and share in this feast, for this is why he has given it to us, that we might gather together at the table, one people united in Jesus Christ. Friends, as you are partaking of this sacrament at home, I invite you to pause the video at this time and gather what items you might like to use for the sacrament. Uh, certainly grape juice and bread or wine and bread is, is good to use, but any element you have at home that will serve is fine. And if you have nothing at all or you wish to, to not partake at this time, please partake of this sacrament by faith so that you might be nourished in love by Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's join together in the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is our joy and our privilege to worship and praise you, God, for we recall the words of the psalm that you prepare a table for us even when enemies are encamped around us. You heal us, you bless us, so that our cups indeed run over. In ancient days, you joined a table with Abraham and Sarah to give shape to their hope when all seemed hopeless. You inspired your people to ask, why is this night more blessed than others when they celebrated Passover in Egypt and again and again over eons hiding from oppressors, celebrating in days of restoration? With all these saints of old, the saints who have graced our lives and hoping in you that others might see your grace reflected in our lives, we come to this table that you have set where Jesus is our host and friend who lays down his life for the world. As we gather, hear us pray for all who long for your welcome and healing, all who suffer from pains inflicted by others, pains of worldly strife, the burdens of inequality, the tragedies of oppression, the unjust use of power. Hear us as we pray for all who suffer hunger, disease, natural disaster, loneliness, isolation, imprisonment, poverty, hatred, ignorance, or illiteracy. In your vision of the heavenly table, all will come from east and west and north and south. And hear our prayers. It reaches out to all people in our world. And we ask that your arms will be opened wide to our whole creation, to all the creatures you have made, to the forces at work in Earth's climate, to touch the microscopic in the realm of bacteria and virus, to encompass, encompass all things in your care. Grant us wisdom and peace, trusting in your power to redeem all things. We come to this table bearing our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and the burden of our concern, acknowledged and unconscious. And with artists of the ages and with the powers of our inspired imagination, we envision this table representing our church family gathered in various places and also our church family throughout this community and with believers in every place. This table reaching far into the past so that we are seated with those who, whose kin we are, who hoped in us that we would follow them, reaching back, far back, and yet still held in your eternal present, and this table reaching far into coming days so that our kin, still young and those not yet born, in whom we hope, gathered with you and in you with us, linking us in the power of your redeeming grace, all under the loving voice who calls out to us, reassuring and peaceful, saying, See, I am making all things new. O oh Lord God, 
make us new. For we gather here with all your saints and with them and with all the believers of all times and places. We unite our voices in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus, when he had given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this, remembering me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, remembering me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And now as we go from the table, let us be joined again in prayer. O God of glory, in this holy feast, you've made us one with Christ and with that great multitude of the faithful who hunger and thirst no more, who worship night and day in your eternal temple. Lead us in paths of righteousness. Guide us to springs of the water of life until we join with all of the redeemed giving thanks and glory to you with unceasing praise. Amen. Well, as we go into the world, may we keep the words in our heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And as you go, know that the grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit is with you so that you may live in faith, abound in hope, and grow in love now and forever. Amen. Amen.